Welcome back. I made a little bit of change to the slide. So this is the updated version. Now, in Massive MIMO, it turns out that we can create so-called favorable propagation conditions. And as we will see, we, we, will, we would like that the, the channels of the different users, at least the, the small scale fading part of this, behaves as follows. So that if I take the matrix G of all the channels in uplink and I compute G Hermitian G, which is a K by K matrix. So this here is a M by K matrix of uplink channels. Right. I would like that this matrix satisfies this condition that it becomes equal to an identity matrix K by K with a scaling linear in the number of antennas at the base station. And we will see that, well, we will see later that in line of sight, this is really true. And we will see now in non line of sight that this is also true. So in non line of sight under rich scattering and really fading, the entries of this G matrix will be IID complex Gaussian zero mean variance one. So let's look at an example with 10 users and a, uh, 20 base station antennas. Then this G matrix, when you compute, compute this product here, will give rise to this. So this here is given as G Hermitian G. And you see that, okay, it's not really like a diagonal matrix, but at least on the diagonal it's quite large and then off the diagonal it's smaller. When you now increase the base station antennas to 200 and you compute G Hermitian G, you will see now that it really looks like a scaled identity. So it's zero or small values everywhere, except on the diagonal and on the diagonal, it's about 200, which is the number of antennas. So this condition here of so-called favorable propagation conditions holds in line of, in non line of sight, line of sight, we will see later. So if this holds, how can we use this? So these are our models. We will have, again, base stage with M antennas and M much larger than the number of users. Each user has one antenna. We assume that we have favorable propagation conditions. So that means that G Hermitian G is approximately M I K. And this means that when we have channel reciprocity, we have nearly orthogonal channels in uplink and downlink. In uplink, the total channel from all of the users to the base station is a matrix G, and this matrix is a M by K matrix, given by the fast fading part and then the slow fading part. So this is the path loss here in this D matrix, path loss and shadowing. And we know that this G Hermitian G satisfies that it's approximately M times an identity matrix. So this is what happens in uplink. In downlink, we have the transpose of the uplink channel. So M transpose. This is now a K by M matrix. Okay. And this will be the transpose of this diagonal matrix, but transpose of diagonal matrix is diagonal matrix itself times G transpose. And now this G transpose, of course, satisfy this condition. Right? I just, I find I can go from here to here trivially by just taking the transpose, the, the complex conjugate. So this is just conjugate. Good. But we see that when this favorable propagation condition is satisfied, then we have certain properties that we can exploit later for uplink and downlink. So this is what we will do next. We, we know this information. We know that the channel satisfied these conditions and now we will exploit it in uplink and downlink. First, the easy case, uplink. We have all of our users transmitting data to the base station. The uplink channel from one user is given by this. It's a long vector. Squared of di represents path loss and shadowing. And then we have this vector g with iid complex Gaussian entries. If you look at all the observations together, it's a superposition of all the signals from all of the users plus noise. And we know that H is J times D over one half times X. And again, it's good to look at the dimensions. This is M by K, right? Where I just stack all of the vectors for these different users. So this is a very 
tall matrix. This is k by k, so this is a small square matrix. And then from the user, this is k by 1, so this is a vector. And again, m is much larger than k, so a very tall matrix, small matrix, and a small vector, plus noise. We now can compute the following. We can compute the product HH Hermitian. We just plug in what is H, and we find this expression. And we know that, well, approximately, this is an approximation, G Hermitian G is a scaled identity. Okay, so that we can bring out M, the identity. And in the end, we find the following, that H Hermitian H is M times a diagonal matrix. And this diagonal matrix is a k by k matrix, so a small matrix with values d1 till dk. Okay. And these represent the power due to path loss and shadowing. So with this in mind, what does the base station do? The base station takes this long observation okay, of number of antennas and pre-multiplies it with h Hermitian. Okay. So this here is m by 1, and this is k by 1. And so y is a super long vector, maybe of length 100, and z is a small vector, maybe of length 10. How does this z now relate to what is transmitted? We plug in y, so this is y, plug it in here. We now know that, know that h Hermitian h is m times d, so we obtain m times d, plus we have noise, where this noise covariance we can compute using again this property, and it turns out to be equal to this. So the noise is zero mean with a diagonal covariance matrix with a scaling of m. We can now look at the kth entry in this vector z, zk, will be m times dk times xk plus wk, where this noise power has this value wk. From that, we can compute the signal-to-noise ratio, so that will be, maybe I can do this explicitly, Signal to noise ratio will be m squared times dk squared times ex. So that's the noise, that's the signal part over the noise power n naught times m times dk. And then I will cancel out dk here, m here. So then I obtain m ex over n naught. And that's what's written oh, times dk times times dk. Okay, this d should be small. And that's exactly what's written here. So this is the signal-to-noise ratio that the base station sees for the kth user. With the signal-to-noise ratio, there's a certain rate that is attached. So the rate for the kth user is the bandwidth log 2, 1 plus SNR. And then the total rate for all of the users together is the sum of the individual rates as given by this expression. And this turns out to be, without proof, the maximum rate that you can achieve for this system. So this means that this matched filter, which is really what you're applying here, is a filter matched to the channel, is the best that you can achieve for this system. So again, I recommend that you go through these steps one by one and keep track of the dimensions of everything. And very important is that M is much larger than K, and this is why this works. And the approximation here will become more and more correct the larger M is. In uplink, things are easier because the base station has access to all of the information. In downlink, the problem is a bit harder because now the users need to make sure that they don't they are not bothered by the signals intended for the other users. So this now becomes our downlink model. We have this model, this y is the observation across all of the users. So now y is y1 till yk, where each user only sees one of the entries on this vector. This is given by the downlink channel, right? So this is a k by m channel. This is a precoding matrix. This is, sorry. M by K, and this is the data for the user, this is K by 1. So now W is a matrix that is like this, very tall matrix, M by K. Okay. 
And now we will use the following precoder. We will use it as follows. We will say that W is the complex conjugate of H times a K by K diagonal matrix over square root of M. And this matrix D here, we will make sure that the norm of W, so defined as the trace of W Hermitian W, is equal to the total transmit power. If we plug in this W in this expression, we find W Hermitian W is equal to, well, the D over 1 half goes here. We have 2 times squared over M, this becomes M, and inside we have H, H transpose H, compl H complex conjugate, and again this D. This thing here, if we go back, so H transpose H Hermitian, if we go back a few slides, we see this. So H transpose H star will be equal to M times D, right? This follows from this relationship. So we can plug that in now um, here. So this will be M times D. Then we open then we can cancel out m here like this and then we obtain this relationship here and now these are all diagonal matrices so then uh, we, we can multiply the two of these together i think it's important just to em emphasize d is a k by k matrix of path loss plus shadowing right and then dp is the power allocation okay also k by k of power allocation that's why we have these two different d matrices okay then so then we can just we need to make sure that the trace of this matrix is equal to the total power so that means it's equal to the sum from 1 to the number of users, dp, which is the power for user k, times the path loss of user k. So this has to be satisfied. Then we can plug in this precoding matrix into the observation model here, we plug it in, we express it as function of now the allocated powers, and in the end we find this model. Okay, then this means that, but since each of these are di diagonal matrices, if we look at what user k sees, user k will see square root of m, the path loss, so square root of dk, times the allocated power for that user. So this is the same as pk square root times sk plus nk. So there's no more multi-user interference. We can then compute the signal power and the noise power, and this will be then the signal to noise ratio for user k. And I don't know if I talk about, no, I don't talk about this. So this, this here, this uh, pks, so pks, can be optimized with water filling. Right, because once we know the signal to noise ratio, that means that the rate or the sum rate is equal to sum k from one to k, the bandwidth log two, one plus SNR for the Kate user, and now I should cheat a bit. M times DK times PK times ES over N naught. Right? And then I can maximize the sum rate as a function of P1 through PK subject to sum k from 1, well, subject to the constraint p dot is equal to sum k from 1 to k, pk dk. Okay. 
this kind of problem of course now we've seen this many times this is a water filling problem So welcome back to the last lecture on the Massive MIMO, or the last part of the Massive MIMO lecture. So we've seen Massive MIMO in uplink and in downlink. And I recommend you go through these in detail. If we now compare these and uh, summarize these, so in uplink under these uh, favorable propagation conditions, which we obtain in non-line of sight due to the really fading assumption, we don't need CSI at the transmitter, so the users don't need to know what is their channel. And by doing linear combining at the receiver, so at the base station, by multiplying with the spatial matched filter, which could be uh, implemented in different ways, we can find the optimal sum rate. So we can get the optimal performance in terms of rate. And this turns out to be the same as the performance we would have if all the users were collaborating. So just as if we would have in the standard MIMO system of the same dimensions. In the downlink, again, under these favorable propagation conditions, when the base station has channel state information, it can design a simple linear precoder, um, which could be according to a different criteria and it can be combined with water filling and leads to the optimal sum rate without any inter-user interference. So each user just sees the signal intended for him or herself some of the benefits and drawbacks of Massive MIMO. Benefits are that we have simple processing at the user and base station, so just linear, linear processing. When we have very large number of antennas, this is optimal in terms of the sum rate, and also at the same time the interference goes away. And most importantly for us is that we can serve all of the users at the same time, so we don't need to schedule all the users one by one or over different frequency bands. Downside, because we have many antennas at the base station, this will lead to a large cost and power consumption at the base station. The base station needs to collect just channel state information, which may, may itself lead to large overhead. And also we need to make sure that these favorable propagation conditions are required. And I think in the next slides, uh, let's first talk a little bit about the performance, but later we will revisit this favorable propagation conditions for the line of sight case. So here's an example that I took of the performance of massive MIMO as a function of the number of antennas. And here we see the, the spectral efficiency in terms of the spectral efficiency per cell. In red is the optimal performance that you can get of, in terms of the sum capacity. In this dashed line is the upper bound in case there's no interference. You see when you have more antennas, interference goes away. And here in this uh, dashed line with stars, we see the performance of a uh, zero forcer. So we see that we can get near optimal performance with a large number of antennas. Now under very rich scattering, it makes sense that these favorable propagation conditions hold, but what about line of sight when there's no scattering at all? And we've seen the line of sight MIMO channel already some time ago. So you can recall if you look at the, the geometric line of sight channel in MIMO that the channel between a single antenna transmitter and a multi-antenna receiver is given by this expression. So it is a complex number and then a response vector of an array where for each element in the array you have a complex number. You choose the first element in the array as a phase reference and then the other elements will have a linearly increasing phase according to the index of the antenna. And this uh, phase depends on the spacing between the elements, here dotted as D, the spacing between the elements over lambda, and then a sign of the angle of arrival here, theta. And now it turns out that when these angles are different enough for different users, so let's just write it explicitly. Before we saw that this was equal to GK A of theta K. This was this response vector in the MIMO lecture. And now what I'm claiming is that when we have different users, so let's see, we have the, the base station here with its antenna array and then different users with different angles of arrival. So first user has this angle of arrival, second user has this angle of arrival. 
when these angles of arrival are sufficiently different, again, the favorable propagation condition holds, meaning that the product of these channel vectors is an approximately zero. Of course, if you multiply with it south, hk with this, you would get absolute value gk squared, so the power of the channel times the number of antennas, just as you had in the non-line of sight case. So to verify that this is really true, you can plug in um, the expression of the response vector. And then you will see that you have this difference between the two signs of the angles of arrival. You can further evaluate this and then plot this. And this is, turns out to be what you get. So here is the angular difference between two users. So this is the sign of the angle of arrival of one user minus the sign of the angle of arrival of another user. For 10 antennas, you will have a peak when this difference is zero. So when the user is at the same angle, they will have high correlation, but then quickly this drops. And when you have more antennas, the peak goes higher and also these, uh, they become narrower. So this means that when the number of antennas is really large, that users are always orthogonal. So if I have an array here with different users at different angles, when the number of antennas is, let's say, five, this means that H, okay, user one, user two, H1 Hermitian H2 will be definitely different from zero. But when M, for instance, 500, then you can verify that H1 Hermitian H2 will be approximately zero. So this means that this favorable operating condition, which is this one here, also holds in line of sight. And that this then in turn implies that it holds in the extreme cases of line of sight and very rich scattering. So then it is reasonable that it holds in most propagation conditions that you will experience. I have just one, uh, one more topic to talk about, which is uh, pilot contamination. So as I said, for the base station to perform the pre-coding, even though it is linear, it still needs to know the channel state information. Question is now, how does the base station get this channel state information? And it does this by exploiting the fact that we use time division duplexing, TDD. So more specifically, we will divide up time now in coherence intervals. So this here is one coherence interval of this duration. And we know that during a coherence interval, the channel remains constant. And then later when the base station is transmitting again in the second coherence interval, the channel will have changed. During this coherence interval, we need to do everything, right? We need to send the data and uplink and downlink. And also we need to send pilots for uplink and downlink. So this is one way this could be done. So here, first we send uplink uh, data. And this we can do without knowing the channel, right? It doesn't, the base station just records the observations. Then we send uplink pilots. Based on that, the base station can estimate the channel in uplink. The base station does some processing and then it computes the precoder. So compute W and then it does downlink transmission. And during this whole time, the channel has remained constant. So we see that there are no downlink pilots in this case, um, although yeah, there could be downlink pilots here for the user to estimate the channel, but this uplink pilots is what allows the base station to estimate the channel. So in more detail, in uplink training, we have a certain coherence bandwidth and a certain coherence time. In this bandwidth time product, we can send a total of BC times TC complex numbers. And then there's a certain fraction that we use for pilots. Right? So for instance, here and then maybe a few here as well. And then this fraction here is for pilots and then whatever remains is the one that we use for data and then we have a certain rate when we do data transmission. So there's a trade-off between using more pilots and then having a better channel estimate and maybe better rate. But on the other hand, even if you have a better rate, we have less time to transmit over that rate. 
We would like to have full spatial reuse, so this means that we have limited time for pilot transmission, so there's a chance that some users will have the same pilot. So now suppose that two users have exactly the same pilot trans that they're sending an uplink. That means that their channel estimate will be the sum of their two channels. And this effect is called pilot contamination. The pilots are interfering with each other, and this then leads to a loss in performance, for instance, in terms of rate. And this then means, in turn, that the signal-to-interference and noise ratio are limited by interference. And pilot contamination is one of the problems in massive MIMO. So here is a figure of the signal-to-interference ratio as a function of the number of uh, base station antennas M, and you see that things saturate for very large M. So that means that the performance doesn't grow unbounded because at some point pilot contamination will really hurt you a lot. So what we've seen in this last part of the lecture is, uh, well, we've described what is 5G, what are the differences between single-user and multi-user MIMO? We expressed uplink and downlink as standard MIMO systems. And then we've motivated the use of massive MIMO and extensively talked about um, favorable propagation conditions. And then finally, we, we briefly talked about uh, the concept of pilot contamination. So this ends lecture 11. Thank you.